As a land-grant institution, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign has the responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists. We are currently on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piancasho, Wea, Miami, Moscuti, Odawa, Sok, Meskwaki, Kikapu, Potawatomi, Ojiwe, and Chickasaw Nations. It is necessary for us to acknowledge these native nations and for us to work with them as we move forward as an institution with native people at the core of our efforts. Good afternoon. I would like to welcome everyone who is here with us in person and those who are watching uh, to the sec watching via our Zoom um, venue to the second conversation on our dialogue series. My name is Gioconda Guerra Perez, Executive Associate Vice Chancellor for Diversity. And before I turn the program over Vice Chancellor Garrick, I just have a, a few housekeeping items. The program today is being live streamed and live captioned, and we would like to thank the staff of CITO and DRESS for your help to share this event with our audience online. For those of you who are here with us in person, there will be no cards for questions. Please write them down for questions, and we will collect them and ask as many questions as we can. We will have about 20 minutes at the end of the question. So, we will, uh, so while the panelists are talking, consider that we might want to ask our speakers. At the conclusion of our event today, a recording of this program will be available to watch on YouTube and on the, our website. And with that, I would like to turn the program over to Vice Chancellor Gary, who will introduce today's speakers. Thank you, Gio. Um, good evening, everyone, or good afternoon. Um, I'm very pleased today to be able to introduce our two speakers for today's dialogue. Not only have they traveled a long way to be here with us, this in-person event has been in the planning for over a year and a half now, but it's been delayed because of the pandemic. So it's a great privilege for us to be able to gather together. Yusi and Mohammed joined us virtually this spring for a conversation with Chancellor Jones. So um, while Zoom and remote is, is fantastic, I think it's even better, again, to be here in person. So thank you all for coming. And again, thank you, Yusi and Mohammed, for, for being with us and sharing this time. Yusi Klein Halevi, New York Times bestselling author of Letters to My Palestinian, Palestinian Neighbor, is a senior fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. Together with Imam Abdullah Antalevi of Duke University, he co-directs the Institute's Muslim Leadership Initiative, which teaches emerging young Muslim American leaders about Judaism, Jewish identity, and Israel. Mohammed Darosha, a leading political analyst has spent more than three decades advocating for Israel's Arab sector. He is the Director of Planning, Equality, and Shared Society at Gavat Haviva, Israel's oldest organization promoting cohesion and understanding between its Jewish and Arab citizens. He has also served as a strategic advisor on initiatives for the Arab sector in the Prime Minister's office. Full bios of, our, of both of our speakers are available on the OVC website. So I'll, I'll ask an opening question just to catch us up from where we left off some months ago. How have the, the past six months been? And more specifically, um, for, for those who were not able to join us last time, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, thank you for the question. Now, some people think that dialogue is for the sake of dialogue. I don't believe in dialogue for the sake of dialogue. I think that dialogue is a tool and a mechanism to try to narrow the gaps, and specifically so that for every side can try to fulfill 
their interests into the process of dialogue. Dialogue is a mechanism. Many think, unfortunately, that it is a goal. I do not think that dialogue is a goal by itself. Uh, at the end of the day, there are four things that we try to aspire for in dialogue. The first thing is the humanization aspect. When you engage with, the, with another person or a group in a process of dialogue, you do uh, humanize the other. And without being able to give a human identity and nature to the other, your dialogue will be simply uh, with either the walls or you can do it with yourself. Some prefer to do dialogue with themselves or people that think like them, not people that think other than them. I prefer that the dialogue process is with people that do not agree with me because I have another goal, not just the humanization aspect. My second goal is to try to also debate with them, to try to engage in a narrative debate, uh, to try to prove my point, to, pr to prove that maybe even I have more just cause than their cause. Uh, dialogue is not surrendering your will, and it's not giving up your will. Dialogue is a way, as I said, to also engage in presenting your identity and your narrative and make your perspective clear and, and uh, obvious. The third uh, aspect of dialogue is trying to find mutual interests. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, we cannot fulfill uh, all of our aspirations by just aspiring them. We need partners with whom we can fulfill those aspirations. We need partners with whom we can try to identify where our needs actually meet and where can we create possibly interdependency. Dialogue is, and that's my final point in this introduction, introductory stage, is also a way to change reality. And I'm sorry for those guys that uh, walked out because I think they're missing out exactly what I'm going to say right now. I'm not engaging with dialogue with my Israeli Jewish counterparts in order to buy time which serves them. So clearly time is on their benefit right now. The Israeli Jewish population is benefiting from the existing deadlock in Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. They're, they're changing reality on the ground. My goal from dialogue is to try to change that reality, to try to stop the deadlock, the negotiations deadlock, and try to open some new directions uh, for, and for possibility to change reality. It's not to preserve reality. When you turn your back and walk out, you actually are trying to preserve reality. You contribute to preserving reality, and you're not doing anything other than maybe just staging a statement, which is legitimate. You know, it's legitimate to stage a statement. But when you do that, you're actually missing the opportunity of changing something on the ground. When I uh, engage in dialogue, not just with Yossi, but also with heads of major institutions in Israeli society, I often hold a mirror in front of them. I often show them where discrimination is. And it's not nice dialogue. Dialogue is not something nice. Dialogue is very often something difficult, where if you want to be true to yourself and honest to yourself, you need often to show you perspective of how you read reality and to show someone their ugly face and how they are hurting you and how they're making life difficult for you and how they're abusing you and how they are unjust towards you, it's not that easy. You, you require and you need a great deal of courage to engage into that so that you look in their eyes and you tell them where the problem is. Israeli society, and I think Sean, we, we, I just touched on this in the last this session, Israeli society, and especially the right wing in Israel, has benefited from an interesting uh, stand in the Palestinian side where the, in the Palestinian community there was something called disengagement uh, from any people-to-people -people activities. This happened somewhere around 2006, refusing to engage in any interaction between the Palestinian and Israeli societies. What the right-wing Israeli uh, groups did with that was using this as a tool to say one very convincing statement to, Israeli, to, uh, to the rest of Israelis. And that statement is, there is no partner for negotiations. Well, there is 
Palestinian people. There are Palestinian people. They are the partner for negotiations. But when you close the door, it makes it easy for the right wing to play that game to say there is no partner for negotiations. That's why I think negotiations and dialogue and people-to-people -people activities are Palestinian national interest. It's not to do it for the sake of pleasing the Israeli Jewish population. It's to do it because it's the best service for the Palestinian national interest. Now, usually we'll ask ourselves, what do we dialogue about? And I must say, when we, as in people in personal capacity, engage in dialogue, it's not a substitute for negotiations of the leaders. I'm not the one that is going to deliver the peace agreement. Neither would Yossi deliver the Israeli perspective of peace agreement. But the, at least what we can do is we can soften positions, we can identify where the problems are. And I do admit that I often use my Israeli Jewish dialogue partners to pass messages to the Israeli Jewish society of what is needed on, from them in order to move forward in the Israeli Palestinian peace process. Yes, uh, uh, there has a lot, of, a lot of things have changed in the last six months. The first thing, we've gone through uh, another cycle of uh, violence, a huge cycle of violence in May, uh, a cycle that uh, usually in every cycle like that convinces more and more people that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a lost case and there's no way to try to find a solution that we're getting actually, we're sinking further and further into the deadlock and into the standstill situation. Unfortunately, uh, in, in a way, this is, uh, it, it does contribute to the concept that animosity feeds in, but at the same time, it's another wake-up call for those that think that the only path is confrontation, which is legitimate. Resistance to occupation, which is legitimate. But those that have been thinking that's the only path had at least 73 years to try to prove that that path works. And we see where we are. The result is actually going backwards instead of going forward. And that's why my choice of engaging in dialogue is in order to try to find and revive the potential where people can try to create solutions when governments are not able to create solutions. We are experimenting for the last 73 years failures of governments on the Israeli and the Palestinian side. I think both sides are failing to try to find a solution. Each side thinks that time is on their benefit, time is benefiting their case, while in reality we are going into a future which no one knows. Is it going to be two-state solution? Are we getting closer to two-state solution? I doubt it. Are we going to one-state solution? Are we getting closer to one-state solution? I also doubt it. I think we're going to a no-direction solution. Everyone thinks that time is on their benefit, time is benefiting their case, and in reality, we're just complicating reality more and more. And that's why when we speak about the need for the people-to-people -people dialogue, it's trying to break this deadlock of nowhere to go. Right now, Israelis and Palestinians are going somewhere no one understands. There's a Palestinian split that contributes to the uh, Israeli right-wing uh, position of no partner to talk to. And there is an Israeli weakness of the, what we call the center left that has sort of surrendered their will to the right wing by saying, OK, we tried it once at Oslo. We failed. We're not going to try it again. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Mohammed, I'm honored to be your dialogue partner, and I'm honored to disagree with you as well. There are two warring cultures that are playing out in this hall. Those warring cultures are not Muslims versus Jews, not even Israelis versus Palestinians. 
Instead, those warring cultures are between those who are committed to doing the hard work of sitting together, looking each other in the eye, and trying to make peace, and those who are committed to a culture of cancellation, of boycott, of hyperbole, and ultimately of hatred. Muhammad and I have many difficult issues to unpack. On some issues we agree, crucial issues we agree, on some crucial issues we disagree. For us, these are not political debating points. These are life and death issues for ourselves, for our families, for our peoples. And yet, we are committed to unpacking these life and death issues together as Muhammad said, not out of generosity, but because we realize that the alternative is much worse. The deeper issue that's being played out here in this hall this afternoon is how do we deal with our differences? Those differences are tearing apart not only our societies, but your society as well. Humanity is on the brink of major catastrophe in multiple areas. And yet rather than drawing us together, we find ourselves being pulled even further apart. Three years ago, I wrote a book called Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor which was an attempt to reach across this abyss. In the book, which is a series of letters to, at the time, an anonymous Palestinian neighbor, was an attempt to explain who the Jewish people are, why we returned home after 2,000 years to a home that we share with the Palestinian people, why we believe that this is our home as well. But it was an attempt not only to explain, but also to listen. The book was an invitation to my Palestinian neighbors to respond, and hundreds did respond. The book was translated into Arabic, placed for free downloading online, and Hundreds wrote responses and thousands downloaded the book. In a subsequent edition, the paperback edition of the book that came out about two years ago, I included about 50 pages of those letters as an epilogue, letters from Palestinians to their Israeli neighbor. Many of those letters were difficult for me as an Israeli to read. Many of those letters challenged some of my most cherished assumptions about my Jewish and Zionist identity. And yet I felt not only the need to include those letters in a book that I had written to defend my people's narrative, not only to include the counter narrative, but to end the book with the counter narrative. Now, in the current political climate, what we saw this afternoon is only an example. That's countercultural. You're not supposed to grant your political opponent space in your own book, let alone grant your political opponent the final word in your book. And yet I felt that if I were serious, about trying to model a new kind of conversation, a conversation that would somehow manage to break through the walls, literal and, and metaphorical, I needed to take that risk. It was a very painful decision to make, quite honestly, as a writer 
and, uh, and as a Jewish Israeli. But what I have come to realize is that you can't cancel a people. You can't cancel the Palestinian people. You can't cancel the Israeli people. Both the Jews, the Palestinians, are indigenous to the same little tortured piece of land. And the Letters Project, and it is, it's really evolved beyond a book. It's really become a project with a website, with a team of uh, young people promoting the book in Arabic media. And now the Hebrew edition has come out. And, Muhammad has honored me with a response to the book that is included in the Hebrew edition. And my hope now is to begin triggering a deep and painful conversation among Israeli Jews and among Israeli Arabs about what is our future? What is our future as fellow citizens in a state that defines itself as both Jewish and democratic, but has an uneasy balance between both of these identities? What is our future between the state of Israel and what I hope will be a future state of Palestine? What is the place of Israel in the Middle East? The Jewish people returned home after 2,000 years of exile, but we encountered a new form of exile in our return home, which was exile from the region. And my deepest hope for Israel, for the future of Israel, is that we find our place in the region to which we have returned home. Final word about the walkout. The rhetoric that was imprinted on the posters, the slogan, was no normalization to genocide. The attempt to turn Israel into a monstrous, evil country will have only one effect, and that is to strengthen those forces in Israeli Jewish society who will say, you see, no matter what we do, no matter what we say, the world will be against us. That is the effect of the boycott. It strengthens those elements in Israeli society that want what you refer to as the status quo to continue, that don't want peace because they don't want to have to make the concessions for peace. This is exactly what we saw today. This is exactly what those elements in Israeli society thrive on. This is what they need in order to, to succeed. And what we're modeling here today is a painful conversation. It's a conversation about injustice, about fears, fears for existence, anger. Believe me, there is lots of anger to go around in this conflict. Listen to Israeli Jews, listen to Palestinians. Everyone is angry. Everyone is afraid. Everyone has grievances and wounds. And as Muhammad said, we can continue along the path of feeding those grievances and wounds. And we see where that has brought us. Or we can try a different way. And this alternative way is not the easier way. It's more painful. It's less, gra it's less emotionally gratifying. This was an emotionally gratifying display. But we're committed to be sitting together and doing the hard work and hopefully presenting a model, perhaps not only for the issues that we have no choice but to deal with, but perhaps for other issues as well in other parts of the world. Thank you.
go. Um, you, you both mentioned that these dialogues and dialoguing has real-world consequences. It's not simply for um, argument's sake or it's not acad academic. When we last spoke some um, six months ago, I believe, elections were uh, ongoing in Israel. Um, what's, what's happened since then you know, in, in, in terms of um, the situation on the ground, how it's affected um, your perspectives and, and your, your lived realities. Well, uh, Israel is a changing, uh, you know, it's like walking on sand. It keeps changing politically very, very quickly. And the change that we had in the last elections, the change that we had in the last elections was very, very significant this time. For the first time, we were able to get rid of the prime minister that was the master of the deadlock. I think Benjamin Netanyahu was benefiting from freezing any political action on the Palestinian part. That's from one end. From the other end, he was also changing reality on the ground by trying to speed the process of expanding settlements that can prevent the chance of the creation of a future Palestinian state. Very strategic settlements that would cut the possibility of any sequence in territory between, between parts of the West Bank. At the same time, it was also a, the feeding the Palestinian split between the Palestinian Authority uh, and uh, Hamas in Gaza, uh, trying to highlight that and try to feed it as much as possible, sometimes by providing help and support for uh, the Palestinian leadership in Hamas with the $15 million a month money coming from Qatar and so on. So I think that Netanyahu's policy was, as I said, from one end, deadlock in the negotiations table. On the other end, weakening the Palestinian unified position by uh, allowing the creation of two separate positions. And this way, he can come back and ask the question, well, who should we negotiate with? So the fact that he's out is already something good, because the master of that theory is not in power anymore. Is the substitute better? That's a good question now. Because we know that this government is not a cohesive government. This is, a, this is some kind of an anti-Netanyahu government and pretty much not pro anything else. So when, it, when you talk about the Israeli-Palestinian front, they do not have a unified perspective. Almost one third of the government is even more right-wing than Netanyahu himself. And two thirds are more left-wing of Netanyahu which again brings us to the deadlock by saying this government is not going to go anywhere in the direction of negotiations, but we also know that it's not going to go anywhere in trying to feed the split in the Palestinian side or trying to have steps that try to deepen the possibility that we could uh, get more and more distant from negotiations. We also know that the buildup of this government is that the first prime minister, which will rotate in a few months, is the leader of the more radical right-wing party. So in his shift, do not expect much more than possibly, uh, I would say two things. It's a one, and one thing is improving humanitarian conditions of the Palestinians. I think that will happen because there's one expectation that uh, the, the two-thirds of the government, the center-left part of the government, will want to move in that direction. But second, we also had a big change a couple of months before that, and that was the change in American administration, uh, which does have some kind of expectations, maybe not requests yet, but some expectations that the U.S. government will move into that direction. 
I, I want, if you allow me, Sean, before I, I go back to my seat to uh, uh, respond to some of the things that uh, uh, Yossi said. So as Yossi said uh, about me that maybe he agrees with a lot of things and disagrees with most of things, I also disagree with most of things. So it's not a dialogue of uh, where you know, we agree on the process. We don't always agree on, uh, on what brought us to here or what are the narrative aspects. We clearly disagree, for example, about what happened in 1948, who started the conflict. We disagree today about whose state is it. Is it the state of the Jews or is it the state of all of its citizens? Is democracy above Judaism of the state? I mean, Israel says it's Jewish and democratic. So is democracy higher value than Judaism, or Judaism is a higher value than democracy? We, do, we have clear disagreements on, on to those type of issues. But being a father of four kids, all of them are students at university, my concern is not about proving my point. I can easily spend two hours here, prove that everything that Yossi brings from his narrative is wrong. I can do that. Believe me, I have the intellectual capacity to argue with ten yoses. But the question is, what would I have, have, uh, what would I have accomplished with that, other than proving him wrong? We need to try to find ways that bridge the gaps. I, I, I you know, I had the discussion not with Yossi, with another, with another Yossi. His name is not Yossi, but another person about a very recent event, which was just this past September. In September, six Palestinian prisoners broke out of prison. Most Israelis relate to them as terrorists. Most Palestinians relate to them as political prisoners. Now, regardless of what they did, but that's the massive majority of perspectives regarding those six people. They happened to escape and be around my town, my village. So we knew that we couldn't speak publicly in their support, okay, because that would be illegal. But we did, what we did, me and my kids, we prepared food bags and sp spread them around the house, hoping that if someone passes by and needs food, they'll find food. Now, this negates the massive majority of Israelis' perspective of you should not aid those persons that escape because they think of them as terrorists, dangerous terrorists, that need to be brought back into jail. So do we agree with my, uh, the act of my children? Clearly not. But I'm not willing to hide where I stand on this issue also. I'm not willing to hide my allegiance to my people while being involved in dialogue, while being engaged in dialogue, while seeking to get out of the conflict. I do not want an endless Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But at the same time, in the process, while looking for trying to find a solution on one, the human level, and second, the politician's level, the government's level, I know which side I'm with. I'm at the side of my people. I try not to break the law. That's why we were not ready to hand physically to anyone. So we were putting out food all around the house so that someone happens to pick it up so that you don't get legally into any legal issues. But that's, that was the mood in my community. And I'm not ready to walk against my community. At the same time, I'm willing to challenge the deadlock in my community. The deadlock that says, okay, we only need to convince ourselves and negotiate with ourselves. What is negotiating with yourself? It's pretty much justification of your own perspective. I think that Israeli-Palestinian conflict will be resolved first when the Palestinians are able to convince Israeli Jews in the justice of their case not when they convince the American public, 
or the Yuan. They already convinced the Yuan. There are enough resolutions in the Yuan that support the Palestinian case. I think there's a president in the United States that also supports the Palestinian case. But the national and international uh, power structure says that for now, the world stands with Israel. And, and that's why the Palestinians are not being able to move. So the, the Palestinians need to change their audience. They need to influence square one. Influencing square one is influencing Israeli society. So one, how do you influence it? One is stop scaring them. If you're scaring them, they're, going to, they're not going to listen. So this, the events of May have done, in my view, this service to the Palestinians. Because they do contribute. They act, they, 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 they serve as a scare tactic against Israelis. When you scare Israelis, they withdraw and try to say and support the notion what cannot be resolved with force will be resolved with, with more force. If you can't do it with uh, uh, one uh, air raid on Gaza, you can do it with three air raids in Gaza. That's what comes out of those kind of uh, uh, rounds of, of conflict. At the same time, I think that the fact that we were able to uh, stop this round of violence relatively quickly, and specifically when I talk about the violence that erupted inside mixed cities inside Israel, similar to events that happened in October 2000. In October 2000, this led to a mutual boycott between the communities which lasted for almost 10 years. It's a book that was written in 2010 that uh, basically its title was uh, The Lost Decade in Jewish-Arab Relations in Israel. We have not lost a decade in rebouncing. We rebounced, thank thankfully mainly, to the business community in Israel, which basically said we're not going to tolerate a mutual boycott. There is an interest of the Israeli and the Palestinian societies inside Israel to continue engaging economically together and to try to create the environment that supports continued engagement between the two communities. This is something that didn't happen. In October 2000, the business community basically went beneath the table. They were waiting for the waves to pass in order to raise them, them, their heads again. It took them two years to do that. In this incidence, civil society and uh, business leadership took a different stand, a stand that says, we're too exhausted with rounds of violence. We don't want it. And they went with a huge campaign in support of, business, of integrating people in the same workplace and collaborating on the business and in social levels. Okay, can you hear me? When, um, Mohammed, when, you, uh, when you say that it's the Israeli public, that the Israeli Jewish public, that needs to be convinced about the, um, yes, can I? I have permission. So when you say that the Israeli Jewish public needs reassurance for its security fears uh, regarding a Palestinian state, I'd say that I'm a pretty good test case for the kind of Israeli Jew that you need to convince. And I say that because I desperately I say that because I desperately want an end to the occupation. I think the occupation is a disaster 
for me, never mind for a moment the Palestinians. This is a disaster for, for the state of Israel. It's a disaster for the soul of the Jewish people. And so someone like me is, is, a, is an audience, is an open door. I want to be convinced. Now, I know, I know you, Muhammad, as the first Arab political figure, Arab-Israeli political figure, who has stood up and challenged the Israeli Jewish public in the following way. We, the Arab-Israeli community, the Palestinian-Israeli community, need to accept reality, and here I'm paraphrasing you, need to accept reality, and accept the fact that Israel is a Jewish majority, and, the Jewish, and a majority has certain rights. And, now, and those rights include defining Israel as having a special relationship with the Jewish people around the world. But at the same time, I challenge you, the Israeli Jewish public, to take seriously the identity of Israel as a democracy and, as, and the challenge to define what it means to be an Israeli state. Because Israel really is, in effect, is, is entrusted with two national identities. The first goal of, of, uh, of the Zionist movement was to reconstitute the Jewish people, and it did that by gathering Jews from disparate communities around the world back into a coherent, functioning people. But at the same time, Israel, and I don't think that the founders, uh, or at least the early Zionists, were fully aware of the full consequences of statehood, because at the same time, they created a new national identity called Israelis. And, these, and this national identity is amorphous. It overlaps with the Jewish people, but it isn't entirely identified. It isn't entirely the same. 20 plus percent of the Israeli public are Arab citizens of Israel. What does it mean for us to share an Israeli civic identity. And so I am committed, and here I agree with you, I'm committed to creating to a more robust Israeliness that is elastic, that is not the equivalent. Israeli does not equal Jew, and all too often we Israeli Jews use Israeli as a shorthand for when we mean Israeli Jews. And I'm also with you on a two-state solution. That's the positive side of the ledger. Where it gets problematic is over the question of trust. Now, I trust you. I trust you as a friend. I trust you as a colleague. But I have to tell you that when you speak about relating to Palestinian escaped prisoners who murdered civilians, and you relate to them as political prisoners, then I wonder, have we reached the limits of our capacity, given the current circumstances, given the conflict? Have we reached the limits of our ability to really create a shared Israeli civic space? And I ask the question as well about, can I really trust a Palestinian state to be a, a safe neighbor? I live on the very edge of Jerusalem, the last row, literally the last row of houses before the West Bank. I look out on the next hill to two Palestinian villages. And if there will be a Palestinian state, that will be Palestine on the next hill. Will that state be peaceful? 
Will it be committed to coexistence with Israel? Or will it be another Gaza? Will I be able to maintain normal life on my hill if the next hill is a Palestinian state? And so I have two nightmares as an Israeli. The first nightmare is that there won't be a Palestinian state. And the occupation continues. The second nightmare is that there will be a Palestinian state. And it will make Israel's ability to defend itself in one of the most volatile regions on the planet almost impossible. When I look around my borders today, I see terror enclaves in the north, in the south. And will a Palestinian state on my eastern border be one of those enclaves, or will it be something else? And, and I say this not as someone who's trying to score points against the Palestinian cause, as someone who wants to endorse the Palestinian cause. And there aren't that many Israeli Jews today who, after 70 years of conflict, would stand up and say, I support a two-state solution, and I want to be convinced. And so what I'm really trying to say is that if this is where I'm at, it's the, the way to peace, the road to peace, is long and arduous. And convince me, because I really want this terrible situation between our two peoples to, to be replaced by a relationship of mutual respect, where each people is honored in its national sovereignty in its right to define itself as a nation, in its right to create its own institutions. And what I want for my neighbors is exactly what I want for myself. And I know that if my neighbors are not thriving, then ultimately I won't have peace either. And so I need to be convinced, I want to be convinced but I'm not yet convinced. I think the example of the six escapees is a, is a great point to focus this a bit more. Um, how do you advocate for your own values, your own, the issues that matter to you and your beliefs while building trust and, and, and faith in the process with one another? Well, I think that the basic thing is, first of all, know who you are. If you're true to your own self, your own community, you know, you know the who, who sends you to do the work? Who sends me to do the work? It's my values. It's my morals. I do not endorse violence in any means. I do not support violence in any means. I do not think it's e efficient also. How many thousands of people have been killed in the name of the conflict? Many have been killed in the name of the conflict. So when I look at it in a realistic perspective, I think it's naive, and I think I mentioned this already, it's naive to think another cycle of killing will solve the problem. So I'm not, I'm not necessarily a peace activist or what's called the peacenik. I, I don't think that you need to come with those kind of high values in order to promote peace between Palestinians and Israelis. I think before the values, you need to think about the practicality. The shortest practical to solu solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not another round that will have another 100 or 1,000 people killed in it. That's not going to get us closer to a solution. We've tried it. So many have tried it. 
there are about 12,000 prisoners, Palestinians prisoners in Israeli jails. Many of them were part of trying that. There are many Israeli generals that got their uh, status out of being part of the war machine against the Palestinians also, and the Palestinians being part of the war machine against Israelis. So we created even leaders in the name of war machines. Some of them were called terrorists at some time, like Prime Minister Shamir, who was a terrorist and wanted person, and became a prime minister afterwards, and was excused from his terrorist acts because he became a political leader. So we did not, I did not invent Yossi, the art of calling a person a political prisoner or a political leader while having maybe blood on their hand. It's not my creation. It's a creation also within the Jewish people. So do not blame me of seeing someone that fights for their freedom as someone that is a political prisoner. They're not fighting because they're criminals. They do not have blood in their hand for criminals. So maybe you and I disagree on their path or their way, but that does not mean that we do them as complete unhuman figures that do not deserve respect at least for their political cause. They probably would not have fought against Israelis if there was no occupation. They would not have fought against Jews if there was no occupation. They did not choose to fight against Israel. They did not choose to have Israel come and occupy their land. So from one end, I do support the notion of dialogue, 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 nonviolent approach and, and, and effort to try to find a solution. But in no means do I support nice occupation. In no means do I support Palestinian willingness to accept occupation as a permanent status they live under. They have the right to resist occupation. Maybe I don't agree in the me with the means, but they have the legitimate right. If it, if it would be a non-violent resistance, that would comfort me even more. I think that will buy them more Israeli Jewish ears. That will be more easy for Israeli Jews and people around the world to sympathize and empathize with them. But that's not something that, you can, that I, I can dictate to the Palestinians under the pressure to say, listen, my way is the best, best way. My way is one of the ways. It's one of the ways. They choose other ways that I think sometimes are maybe even immoral as some of the actions of many of the Israeli Jews during liberation were also immoral, as taking and, and confiscating the land of my family was also immoral. When turning a community uh, into becoming poor as a result of institutional discrimination is also immoral. So. I think that the first thing to, if you want to really be engaged in a, in a dialogue and stay comfortable with it, is to know that you're doing it for the sake of your own community and not for the sake of the other community. Be selfish, yes. I am selfish. I am engaging into this out of the interest of my own community because I think it has, there's a better chance for the Palestinians to develop a future and destiny together with the Jewish people and not against the Jewish people. It's very rational approach to things. At the same time, I do have the moral values that say no to violence and so on, but is that the only motivation? No, that's one of the motivations. So I would, my answer is that it's a dual response. One is interest-based and one is value-based. One of the, um, the reasons why I believe these conversations are so valuable is because they help us see more clearly 
both the areas in which we agree, but also in the areas in which we disagree. And then we need to think, okay, how do we then move forward beyond these disagreements? So for example, one of the major disagreements between uh, Israeli Jews and Palestinians, including Palestinian Israelis, is over uh, who is at fault for the status quo, who is at fault for the occupation. And ask most any Israeli Jew, and the answer will be, well, Palestinian leaders repeatedly uh, rejected offers for a two-state solution. Not in the last 10 years under Netanyahu, because there were no credible offers, but before that, there is a history of, uh, of Israeli offers and of Palestinian rejection. Now, whether you agree with that narrative of uh, the failed history of, uh, of the peace process or not, I think it's really important to understand that most Israeli Jews deeply believe that that's what happened. And so if you believe that your side repeatedly tried to make peace, again, even if we disagree on that, let's assume the narrative is wrong. Still, if you deeply believe that your side tried to make peace, and that the occupation persists because, in large measure, because the Palestinian leadership rejected two-state solution, then the burden of guilt disappears. And I think that one of the big disconnects is that Palestinians, understandably, expect Israeli Jews to feel guilty for the occupation. Most Israeli Jews do not. And it's precisely because of this Israeli narrative of the history of the peace process. Now that's what we have to work with. Again, whether you feel that that narrative is, is, is faulty or not, that's the reality. And so when you speak about resistance to the occupation, what I would respond, and, and I'm very much a normative Israeli Jew in the sense that that is my narrative as well. That's my reading for, of, uh, for why the peace process has failed. I believe that Israel at crucial moments said yes, and at crucial moments the Palestinian leadership said no. And so when I hear Palestinians defending violent resistance, my response was, well, it could have been different. There could have been a Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital, with dozens of settlements uprooted, rolled back. And so that's one of the areas in which the disagreement is stark. And I would say that, in, that that has really become this, this dual narrative, this dual reading of these opposing narratives over the failure of the peace process has really become foundational in, uh, in the dysfunctional nature of the relationship between the two peoples. And that's something we need to address. I won't convince Mohammed. Mohammed won't convince me. We've tried over the years. And, uh, but it's, it's, it's crucial that both peoples understand how the other perceives the failure of the peace process, because otherwise we're really going to continue the deadlock. The last point is really to address, uh, address your question, and here I, I deeply agree with Mohammed that the way in which to, to make peace is to stand firmly within your own people's story not to approve of every aspect of, uh, of your people's politics, but to affirm the basic justness of your people's story. And from, if you don't respect yourself, if you don't respect your own story, you're not really going to respect the other. And so all peacemaking, I believe, begins, ultimate, begins first 
with making peace with yourself, making peace with your story, and then extending outward. And the last point here, in terms of the values that one brings to this dynamic, is ultimately it's not about affirming the right ideological approach. That's not how peace happens. Peace is not about ideology. Peace is about an opening of the heart. It's about recognizing the finitude of human existence, about recognizing the imperfections of all of our national narratives, of recognizing that we are flawed, imperfect human creatures who sometimes do things they shouldn't do and at other times really do aspire to be better, to transcend. And making peace is really a process of the heart. And if you, if you relate to peace as a technical process, which is one reason I believe that the peace process uh, between us has failed all these years, because it was a peace process of the diplomats, of the technocrats, and not a peace process of the heart, then the stalemate will continue. And what we need the next time around at the table are not only diplomats, but we need poets, we need theologians, we need psychologists, in addition to the diplomats whose job it is to figure out the fine print. But ultimately, I'm in a relationship with you, Mohammed, because you're a person of the heart. And you're a person who sees me and is demanding that I see you. And that's the way peace will happen. Before we get to the questions from the audience, um, one, one question speaking going to your point, uh, Izzy. Um, what, what have you personally learned of and from each other during this journey? Give me time to Well, what I learned from Yossi is, first of all, patience and listening. You know, when I read his book and reread his book and reread his book, I think it was one of the very few occasions where I felt here's a Jewish person that is making the effort, one, to speak to me, and second, inviting me to speak to him. And I think this is very daring from one end and very generous from the other end. I also learned that Yossi has a huge tolerance level uh, to hear things that an average person would have a quick knee-jerk reaction. And uh, that uh, the best way to continue engaging in dialogue is by being able to absorb things that you do not have to respond to. So often you hear things and you don't have to respond to things. Just that's his truth. He hears my truth, and I probably know that often he does not agree with what I'm saying there, with what I'm saying. And he doesn't have to respond for everything. And I learned that also I don't have to respond for everything. Just let that perspective be out there. Respect it, disagree with it. You know, disagree with it. I don't, have, I don't have to accept and agree with it. But it's out there. You know, when we say that it's a reality, Israel is a reality, but also the narratives are a reality, even if I don't agree with them. Even if I do not agree with those narratives, they are a reality. They exist. They probably negate my own narratives, so I feel that I need to also present my own narrative. So 
What I'm learning is also that in order to engage in dialogue, you need to have not just that courage and patience, you also need to have a big, a, a big heart, a big mind, and the intellectual capacity to also uh, stand for your own perspective. And also when you give someone uh, positive, uh, encouraging feedback, it's something that is n you're not losing points. So if I commend Yossi, you know, if he commends me, we're not, he's not winning over me. It's not, you're not becoming subordinate to someone if you give him a commendation, even for the style of the way he speaks, maybe if, if the content is not something that you agree with. And I think that what I've also learned from Yossi is that he does have, and I wrote it in my letter to you, he has the uh, generosity to extend his hand when many people do not have not the generosity and not the wisdom and not the uh, courage to do it. And uh, he's willing to receive back. When you extend your hand, sometimes people do shake, send their hand back to shake it, or maybe to slap it. But you need to courage to send it out to feel the atmosphere outside. And that's something that I learned from him, and I'm trying to do it. And I promised you I'm going to write a book, letters to my Israeli Jewish friends. And you, and you actually may do it here on campus. <laughs> what I learned most of all from Mohammed is dignity. The way in which he bears his pain, his, his deep wounds, with a profound, quiet, and determined dignity. The ability to express his pain, his anger, his hurt, and at the same time, not leave the table. I'm sure there are times you're tempted to and never to leave. And he's been doing this for year after year. And there's no one that I know in Israeli society who's more effective in bringing Arab citizens into the mainstream than Mohammed. So what I've learned is the dignity of I would call it a deceptive patience because Muhammad is not a patient person. But he's able to act as if he has all the time in the world. And that combined with his goodwill, with the fact that he's willing to stand up here with an Israeli Jew and subject himself to what we saw today. And you know, for me, that walkout was not as painful, I would imagine, as it was for you. There's a war going on. There's a conflict. What can I say? I'm used to it. Uh, when, it when you're attacked by your own people, that's more painful. And Muhammad is willing to put himself in situations of acute discomfort for the sake of advancing his people's agenda, his people's needs, and ultimately for the sake of all the peoples in this conflict, because I believe that Muhammad, as deeply rooted and committed as he is in his story and in his people, is not confined to that commitment. And he challenges me as someone as well who is deeply rooted in my own people's story, my own people's needs, fears, not to stay there, but to constantly place myself 
in vulnerable situations. And that really is something that I've learned from you. Thank you both for that. And I, I, one, one thing I find absolutely remarkable is in addition to the dialogue and the way of engaging in, in, in this very um, important and critical topic is you're actually doing the work. We can have a conversation about what you are doing, not simply about how we engage around these topics, but you're absolutely doing the work. And I, I, I find that personally deeply, deeply impressive. So thank you personally. Um, questions for the audience, Gia? So Gia just said there's lots of questions if you didn't hear that. For both of you, if there's no two-state solution and there is no one-state solution, is there any kind of path? Dialogue is fabulous, but can you envision an equitable Palestinian-Israeli coexistence? You know, Sean, you mentioned earlier, uh, we discussed the issue at the beginning, whether Israel is the state of the Jewish people or the Israel is the state of the Israelis. And uh, Yossi spoke about this in his opening uh, remarks. There is a debate about this. I, I call it the vertical debate about the identity of the state. Whose state is it? Whose state is it? If we put that debate, that vertical debate, on the shelf for a moment, you know, we're not deleting it because it stays and probably will accompany us for many, many generations ahead. I'm not that hopeful that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict will be resolved that quickly. What do we do between now and then? And then could be five years, 10 years, 20, maybe 100 years. I do not know. I'm not a prophet. It's another Muhammad who's a prophet. What do we do between now and then? And it's not just us as individuals, but what is Israeli society and Palestinian society doing? And that's what I call the horizontal arena. Israel that is trying to Judaize its identity through passing that law, the nation state law, which was passed on the 19th of July, 2018, and I relate to that as a racist law, is actually becoming less Jewish, more Israeli. On the ground, the process of Israelization, Israel, is faster than the process which is led by the political leadership which is trying to Judaize Israel. Now, where do you see it? If you go to the medical arena, you go to hospitals. Because the Israeli governments have sort of slowed the integration of Arab citizens in civil service, in banking, finance, in academia or so, people sought alternative routes of education. People started sending their kids to study mostly high-level, high-end type of topics, mostly in the medical arena, and ended up flooding the Israeli market with doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and uh, uh, dentists. The Arab Palestinian minority in Israel is about 21% of the population, but is, but is almost one-third of the medical staff. Now, that's a revolution we created. Now, Israeli Jews that go to seek medical attention or treatment, they are going to meet Arab medical providers. And that changes their perspective of what an Arab is. It's someone that could be a caretaker for them. It's happening in the high-tech industry. Just about seven years ago, the percentage of Palestinian Arab citizens who are part of the Israeli high-tech industry was less than one and a half percent. Seven years later, we're about 7% of the high-tech industry. If you go to universities, you'll see that 22% of the engineering students are Arab Palestinian citizens in Israeli universities. 22% of the engineering students. And this is a revolution in the making that is going to challenge the makeup of the 
uh, human resources that are running the biggest engine in Israeli economy, which is the high-tech industry. If you go to universities, Sean, you know, being a university official, 2003, the percentage of Arab students in Israeli universities was close to 3.5%. Today, it's 19%. From 2003 till now, an 18% climbed from 3.5% to 18%, and it happened out of two reasons. One, very high appetite for social economic mobility within the Arab Palestinian minority inside Israel, seeing education as their vehicle forward, to move forward. Strong appetite, the community is working very hard to send their kids to school and so on. On the other side, Israeli academic institutions are beginning to create space and accept more and more Arab students to study those kind of higher positions out of need, out of an interest, but they're beginning to create it. And it becomes a new norm. The Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where I did my undergraduate degree, when I went there, it was a very discriminatory university. When my daughter went there five years ago, she discovered that in the uh, school calendar, there's a holiday that didn't exist in my time. It's called Eid al-Adha, the holiday of the sacrifice, a Muslim holiday where there is no classes on that day, which basically is an extension of probably respect that the universities give providing to the Muslim students studying at that university. So something, there are certain things that are changing on the ground, whether it's in academia, in high tech, in finance, in, in the medical industry, that are the exact opposite direction of what the government is doing. The government is trying to more and more Judaize Israel, but the market, the field, the community is, is doing more of a civic nature, is creating more of a civic and less of an ethnic nature of the state of Israel. If we are able to identify the difference between what I call the vertical debate on identity versus the horizontal process where reality is overtaking, I, would, I come with the conclusion that the politicians are in Israel, the political leaders in Israel, are somewhere around 20 years behind society. Society is faster than the political leaders by at least two decades forward. Another question. What do you do when you worry that you may have reached the limits of dialogue? I meditate. <laughs> I second that. If you could go back in time to when Israel was established, what would you change to lower, the, to lower the tensions caused? How would you foresee this conflict eventually coming to an end, either? Oh, I can't. Well, how, I, I can't make out the rest of this, but how, how do you foresee this conflict eventually coming to an end? So part one, if you, go, if you could go back in time to when Israel was established, what will you change to lower the tensions? Well, I would not have done two things. One is treat the Arab-Israeli minority, especially in the early years, as a potential fifth column. I would have embraced them as citizens uh, with all the wounds that they carried uh, out as a result of, uh, of the 1948 war. I would have done everything possible to, to try to reassure them that there is a place of equality in Israeli society. And I would not have permitted the settlement movement uh, to, uh, to spread to the extent that it has. And so those were the two, uh, for me, those are the two major mistakes uh, that uh, successive Israeli governments have made. I 
think, I think Israel's biggest mistake in 1948 was not announcing borders. Israel till today does not have borders, which basically gives the Palestinians the impression that it's an expansionist state that wants to continue the conflict until it gets more and more land and uh, defines the borders at a, later, at a much later stage. If Israel would have defined borders for itself and uh, legitimized that by passing a law that these are the borders of the state, then I think Israel would be able to really think in its real size and not in expansionist size. Another question says, hasn't the problem transcended Israeli Jews and Palestinians as long as Iran supplies Hezbollah North and Hamas South against Israel? Why can't Israeli Jews and Palestinians partner to fight those forces who support Hezbollah and Hamas? Well, the conflict certainly transcends the uh, Arab-Israeli dimension. And um, Israeli Jews for, uh, for many years had a kind of a split screen uh, in their heads when they, when they conceived of the conflict. On one side of the screen, it was Israel against the Palestinians. Israel was Goliath, the Palestinians were David. On the other side of the screen, it was Israel against the region. And there, the balance of power was a lot, uh, a lot more uh, uh, open to question. And so the, the, the ways in which, in which uh, the Israeli public relate to this conflict really do transcend the Palestinian issue. Uh, one of, what gives me hope in the last uh, year or so, and, and perhaps, Mohammed, we disagree about this as well, uh, uh, is the proliferation of uh, peace agreements between Israel and Arab countries. And this gives me hope not only for Israel finding its place in the region and for lessening uh, the Israeli-Jewish sense of siege, which I see as, as crucial to, uh, to eventually convincing the Israeli-Jewish majority to, uh, to go for a two-state solution. But I think it also opens opportunities, not necessarily now, but in the long term, uh, for a regional solution to the Palestinian issue. I'm not sure that Israel, uh, the Israeli and uh, Palestinian leaders left to their own devices will ever be able to negotiate a deal. Uh, and uh, as we've seen in the past, uh, during the Oslo process especially, uh, the West uh, has very ultimately very limited ability to impose its vision of peace on the region. If there's going to be peace in the region, it needs to be generated by the region itself. And if Israel, if Israelis sense that they have Arab partners for an agreement, for a transformation of the region, then I think many more Israeli Jews can be convinced to consider or to once again consider a two-state solution. Because we did have, in, in the late 90s, there was the beginnings of a, of a majority uh, of Israelis who, Israeli Jews who supported a two-state solution. And then the second intifada of the early 2000s essentially erased that majority. So in order to reconstitute a majority of, his, of Israeli Jews in support of a two-state solution, there needs to be a sense that Israel will have Arab partners for a regional agreement. And in the end, I believe, uh, and this goes back to the question about a two-state solution, uh, I believe that, that ultimately uh, creating a two-state solution will depend on, on the transformation uh, of the region. We are running short of time, so I'll ask one last question. Uh, what do you think is the role that religion plays in this conflict? Well, 
for the Jewish part, religion is part of the identity of the Jewish people. You know, without uh, the religious Jewish religion, probably Jewish ethnicity would be lacking some significant component. Uh, there is, you know, the concept of, of Zionism is that Judaism is not just a religion, it's also an ethnicity. That's the concept of Zionism. So it's, it's a, at least in the Jewish side, there's a very strong component that play, played role in nation building, but it's also now playing a role, in my, in my perspective, a very negative role, where ultra-religious nationalists are trying to capture Jewish national identity into a radical perspective Bordering racism, if not even spell it out, often say, presented as racism, where they think that the Jewish religious slash national identity is providing them some kind of superiority by God. And unfortunately, many Jewish nationalists today who are in power positions carry that perspective. I do not think that the majority of Israeli society, I do not think that they are the ones that carrying all, calling all the shots in Israeli society, but they definitely do have a significant impact on the uh, Israeli-Palestinian cross-border conflict. In the process, uh, there was also the rebirth of political Islam that uh, was influenced by regional uh, Islamic uh, uh, groups, radical groups, that try to recruit uh, or some maybe even ride over the Palestinian cause and use it as a polarizing case in, in the Arab world uh, to try to challenge the regimes in Arab countries, helping to build uh, and strengthen Palestinian radicalization and Islamization in the process. I think this is an attempt to steal the Palestinian cause from the Palestinians and give it a more uh, wider religious perspective. I'm not sure if this does best service to the Palestinians. I think the best service for, to the Palestinians is to be able to find a political solution to the, and a negotiated political solution with Israel about a two-state solution and not to uh, bring it to a level of uh, a clash of civilizations or clash of religions between Judaism and Islam. Religion is either going to be the problem or part of the solution. Uh, it will not be ignored, it will not be a neutral force. Not in Israel uh, and not in the Arab world. And this is the Middle East and in the Middle East, if you're going to ask each people to come to terms with deep and painful concessions, and that's what's going to be required to make peace, each side is going to have to relinquish part of the land that it believes belongs to them by right, through history. Both peoples believe that all of the land between the river and the sea belongs, at least in principle, by right to them. And if we're going to ask each people to, in effect, contract its territorial claim to that part of the land in which it will establish its national sovereignty and cede the other part of the land to the rival claimant, that is going to require the imprimatur of religion. Because there are lots of religious arguments, I'm speaking about Judaism, I'm speaking about Islam, against making those concessions. But both religions also contain deep wisdom. Both religions revere peace as one of the crucial aspects or attributes of God. And so, peace is one of the names of God. And in, in Judaism, we say that, that, that uh, 
the Torah is the Torah of peace, all its ways are peace. And so this conflict forces each religion to put up and to, and to, own, to own its its professed commitment to peace. And there will be no compromise if we continue to place the, the, peace, the peace process uh, in the hands of secular elites on both sides. Secular elites who don't necessarily have the trust of their own peoples. And I think that that was one reason among many for why the Oslo process failed. It was a process that was entrusted to secular elites with very little um, accountability to the profound religious sentiments on both sides. Uh, I wrote letters to my Palestinian neighbor very much as a religious Jew addressing a religious Palestinian. And the responses that I got from, from many Palestinians, uh, many readers, was, you know, we disagree about everything. But when, when, I, when I saw that you wrote as a person of faith, when I saw that you, you, you take God seriously, I felt that I could at least trust you. I could trust your, 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 your basic decency. And that, I think is, for me at least, that was an affirmation of, uh, of the need to incorporate in some way religious sensibilities, religious, religious legitimacy into a future peace process. And um, where I connect most deeply with my Palestinian neighbors uh, is, um, is in the shared sensibility uh, of uh, Islam and Judaism as, as imposing on, on, on believers a, a, a humility, a sense of, of perspective. And what I was speaking about earlier about our mortality, there is no religion that, that, uh, that emphasizes more the, the, the awareness of mortality as much as Islam. Maybe Buddhism. And, and that is a very profound place where Jews and Muslims can connect. And that's the ground for making the kinds of concessions that, uh, that will be required to, to bring us to a different place. I'd like to thank you very much for this truly remarkable conversation. It's been absolutely fantastic. We are at the end. I'd like to thank the office for the Vice Chancellor of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for putting this together. Also, the program in Jewish Studies and all the other units on campus who's worked, who's worked very, very hard over the past year and a half to facilitate this evening as well as the events of uh, last spring. Thank you very, very much. Have a good evening.